All right, welcome everyone, and I'm happy to announce our first speaker, who is a researcher in my group, Roy Cruz. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Roy, and thank you for coming for my presentation. Uh, so today, I'll just, I'm just going to share with all of you uh, what I've been doing with Dr. Kirk's uh, research lab. So to start off with, uh, the ability of eukaryotic cells to uh, resist deformation um, uh, against their environmental factors, being able to traffic organelles and uh, being able to dip, sh um, change shape during movement, it depends on um, the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is uh, made out of three specific filaments, um, which are active filaments, intermediate filaments, and micro microtubules. And for this presentation, we will focus, we will be focusing on uh, microtubules, the importance of microtubules and neurons. And a neuron is composed of two specific components, an axon and dendrites. And, and this red dot represents the cell body of a neuron, and this other end represents the axonal terminal. And uh, the reason why microtubules are, so, are important for neurons is because they maintain the structure of ax axons and, dent and dendrites. Uh, they're also important because they, they also develop a uniform polarity pattern, which helps, um, which helps um, organize the traffic of, uh, of, of organelles. And that, that's what these, in, these figures represent. So usually um, microtubules in, that reside inside the axon have a plus and plus out orientation, which means that these microtubules like to move to the right side. Um, and that, that's what we represent as a uniform polarity pattern. And on the other hand, um, um, microtubules that reside in the dendrites have a mixed polarity pattern where they have like microtubules that like to move to the right side and the left side, which is not very uniform. And uh, the reason why this is important is because uh, microtubules that have a uniform polarity pattern help um, make sure that the polarity is not corrupted because if the polarity uh, the uniform polarity pattern is corrupted, then it, then it starts developing neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's diseases. And that's, and that's what we want to prevent happening. And that is the uh, focus of our study. Uh, and some examples of corruption that happen is when um, microtubules are cleaved, um, flipped, locally nucleated, broken, or bended. And um, in our computational model, we have been use, we have included uh, the cleaved and flip mechanism, and uh, we want to see how uh, that is impacted in our in the model. And uh, microtubules and the axon are pretty much um, are pretty much inside. Uh, microtubules are pretty much inside the axon. The axon is pretty uh, is like a empty cylinder. And these microtubules are just like floating in them. And um, microtubules act as the track for, for, uh, for organelles to move along the axon. Um, however, um, this motor protein called molecular motor is what actually transport the organelles throughout the axon by using... Oh, how can I... Let's see. I can't play the video. Uh, well, this protein would just, uh, so this, these two blue blobs uh, would be moving on the microtubule and these green like um, sites would be the spots that these um, proteins would be, be attaching. And these blobs would be uh, moving subsec uh, subsequently. Um, throughout the microtubule as, as throughout uh, as long as they meet to their destination and a uh, similar process occurs oh now it's playing <laughs> uh, 
Uh, uh, yeah, I'll just show it real quick. So yeah. So, and afterwards, a similar process occurs uh, when, um, when two microtubules are attached to each other. So let's say one microtubule is attached to the cargo domain and another microtubule is attached to the motor protein domains. And, what's, and this, this uh, protein that we're seeing here with the orange dots, these represent, this represents the dining molecular protein. And these dynein molecular proteins like to move to the left side. And um, since they like to move to the left side, this causes a sliding force. And this sliding force causes this top microtube to move to the right side. Um, and that's the same scenario that we see here at the bottom. And the reason why this occurs is because of, uh, according to the law of the third law of Newton, uh, whenever two bodies interact with each other, uh, an equal and opposite force. Um, um, how, uh, curious. And, um, and the, the objective of this project is to test how a specific protein, uh, cross-linker protein, affects the polarity pattern, the uniform polarity pattern in the axon, because the cross-linker protein is, um, the, the purpose of the cross-linker protein is to prevent sliding force to occur. And, and we will be testing two specific uh, cross-linkers, anti-parallel and parallel. And, um, and this system will also contain both of the uh, molecular proteins, um, adionine and kinesin. Uh, so in the computational model uh, also simulates the two specific populations, one that has the plus end out microtubules and the minus end out microtubules and the plus end out are the ones that move to the right side and the other one and the minus end out are the ones that like to move to the left side of the axon. And, and this, bar graph represents the um, distribution or the population of microtubules uh, of the right side and this, this or the orange bar graph represents the ones moving to the left side. And yeah. And this second bar graph represents a, a specific polarity distribution. And, uh, and it's the polarity distribution of the microtubules moving to the left side and proximal what proximal means is like uh, microtubules that are that are residing closer to the uh, cell body region, and the distal region represents microtubules closer to the uh, terminal ax uh, axon. And this is the initial initial polarity distribution and the final polarity distribution. And this this figure represents the movement of uh, of the microtubules. So these horizontal lines that we see here, those are microtubules that have not moved at all throughout uh, the first 100 seconds. And this purple line represents microtubules that are moving, con and that are moving really fast continuously. And this sporadic pattern that we see are um, a microtubule that has been moving back and forth, which is very normal because we have two specific motor proteins, a kinesin and a dining. And since kinesin likes to move to the right side and dining likes to move to the left side, uh, while walking on a microtubule, it creates a tug of war. And that's why we see this, um, uh, this pattern. Uh, we'll just skip that. And um, in case one, so what I did here was uh, I checked for the polarity distribution against uh, an effectiveness, uh, effectiveness with kinesin, uh, motor kinesin. And what we saw is that we, we have a lot of microtubules residing or microtubules that like to move to the left side uh, in the proximal region where they're close by to the cell body. And after, after these microtubules have done the interactions with the cross-linkers and molecular proteins, uh, we noticed that most of them um, left the axon, but some of them still reside in the distal, which is what we want to see because because usually, um, because usually whenever we have a kinesin motor protein, these usually like to move to the right side, which is closer to the axonal terminal. And uh, afterwards, I did a, a case with uh, polarity distribution with a dining 
molecular mo proteins. And we saw that uh, we had a fair distribution in all the regions, but afterwards we saw that uh, most of the uh, microtubules moved to the proximal region, which is what we want to see because um, the, uh, the, because, um, because the molecular motor proteins like to move um, to the left side. And afterwards, um, I tested another polarity distribution where we have uh, parallel crosslinkers. And we saw that the parallel crosslinkers actually assisted the, the, um, the dyne molecular motor protein, which is an indication that all of the minus end out or all of the microtubules that move to the left side are moving to the cell body. And that's our goal. We want to move into the cell body because, um, because if we take, because if they move to the cell body, they're able to readjust and be able to function how they're supposed to function in the axon and to help uh, form a uniform polarity pattern. And, um, and then afterwards I tested um, a crosslinker that has a preference with anti-parallel microtubules. And I, we did not see any change and that is fine because uh, that means that the sliding force was not very effective in this system. Uh, yeah, and so final remarks in in the in the project is that is that the crosslinker that is parallel is much more effective in order to create a uniform polarity pattern, um, and also. An anti-parallel crosslinker is also helpful, uh, and the medical relevance uh, in this project is that it's helping us understand a bit better how microtubules are behaving in the axon, and how we can a better approach or how to study uh, neuro uh, how neurodegenerative diseases are are developed. So yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, so uh, K-on represents uh, the effectiveness of a kinesin attachment. Yeah, and um, the, oh, it means that, um, that we have more kinesin proteins in the system. And the other one just represents that we have more dynein proteins in the system. Yeah, so it's uh, it's simulation data, but we're using uh, experimental parameters uh, because uh, we're using, um, so yeah, it is a, a simulation, but we're using um, experimental parameters that have been used in other tests and other research projects. I'm not sure how, but um, I don't know if we have, if you can find a way to turn the AC off, that might be a solution too. Um, all right, Nick, do you want to come take a glance here and see if you can see which one's yours here? All right. Is that it? Perfect. Okay, let's get you into slide share mode. 
go ahead and Uh, Nick Cameron from the PHX lab. Hello, I am Nick Cameron. I uh, did my undergraduate research here at Central Washington U University with Andrew Piacek, and I did my research on investigating a non-invasive method for monitoring intracranial pressure change using sheep stools. Uh, some the reason we are doing this is because currently there is no medical way that is non-invasive of measuring ICP or inter, intracranial pressure. And we wanted to develop a way that we could possibly use the resonance of a skull to measure uh, re or frequency changes, which correspond to the intracranial pressure. We used a sheep head because <laughs> it was one of the like, best access we had to that would correspond to a human skull. And we also investigated the sensitivity of skull vibration response and, or skull vibrational response to environmental factors and how it would correspond to previous, uh, previous experiments done with a metal aluminum shell. Uh, some background, some students here had previously done research using a metal sphere and, or a, aluminum shell that was uh, filled with fluid and increased pressures from around zero to 100 PSI. From that data, they found that there was a corresponding change in resonance frequencies to the corresponding frequent, er, pressures. And after that, they developed a console model to model the uh, aluminum shell, which co er, cons was consistent with the the frequency shifts were consistent with the measured values that they had previously done. And then later on, a student came along and studied small pressure changes using a modal hammer and consistently found that even for small pressure changes, we were still seeing uh, resonance frequency shifts, which led me to why I am studying what I am. Uh, here is the experiment that they worked with. They had the metal sphere, which can be seen on right around here. And using the uh, pressure or force sensor gauge on the, or force sensor hammer on the bottom left and the pressure gauge on the top left. Uh, from that, they found that for higher frequencies on the top left, around 9.2 kilohertz, they were seeing a uh, relatively large uh, frequency changes around 0.2 hertz per psi. There were some resonance uh, peaks that were experiencing no frequency changes, and for relatively low resonance peaks, they were seeing negative uh, frequent or er, negative frequency changes. On the very bottom, we have a linear graph of the low pressure data that shows that even for zero to two PSI, we were still seeing around a 0.7 Hertz per PSI change. This led me to what I began working on with the ovine head test setup. Here I have one of my three setups that I began working with. And uh, that includes uh, the test subject resting on the table and it being clamped uh, by a support. Uh, I also, in this picture, I have a mechanical oscillator that is being driven with a swept sign signal, which a swept sign signal is a driven oscillator that ranges from frequencies of 3 to 22,000, or as best uh, Dr. Piacek puts it, it's a signal that goes, and uh, we also took data with a impulse hammer or impulse force hammer, hammer, which will be shown right here. As you can see, we had about a 12 millisecond window for this uh, accelerometer data, which is very short when you're trying to take uh, Fourier, Fourier transforms of it. In comparison, the metal sphere was ranging with about six tenths of a second and much like noisier. So we determined that the damping in this system must be very high and it will be a large issue that we will have to work with. Uh, the graph on the right is of this accelerometer data from the sheep skull. 
each different trial corresponds to one tap of the sheep skull. And the, uh, in the data, the accelerometer stays the exact same and we are striking the uh, hammer in the exact same location. Uh, this showed us that we, it, or that all of these resonance peaks above 1.5 thousand would be completely useless because none of them correspond to each other. And uh, we chalked it up to being signal processing. So we decided to move on to the impulse driver or the mechanical oscillator uh, with a range of three to 22,000. On the left, we can see a much cleaner and louder signal uh, with uh, three to four relatively uh, high peaks that correspond to some resonant peak or possible resonant peaks. On the right is the different driving locations that we uh, studied as well and how the accelerometer was attached to the skull. And this was some of my initial data taken on the ovine skull. As you can or the only difference in this data, we have the exact same accelerometer location. The only change was removing the driver itself and trying my best to replace the driver in the exact same location. Uh, from this, we determined that having it resting on the table would not be viable as we were seeing insanely large amplitude shifts as well as frequency shifts. Uh, moving on, we tested out the clamped jaw and we were still seeing large amplitude shifts and large frequency shifts. One thing to notice that we were seeing resonance frequencies at around 8,000 Hertz for both of these and at around 16,000, which was much better than what we were getting from the modal hammer. And for the final, when we suspended the head, we were getting much more clean data. We still had slight frequency shifts, but the amplitudes themselves were not shifting uh, about half the size. We were getting very consistently uh, same, or very consistently the same amplitudes. And finally, we took some data with different locations, which, which confirmed our previous beliefs in that uh, driving near certain antinodes will yield larger amplitudes and that, uh, oh, and consistently location C lo was greater than location B and consistently location B was greater than location A for multiple different trials. So this confirms that we are getting relatively alike data, but we still are seeing small shifts that could be very hard to recognize when we're looking for shifts less than uh, 0.7 of a hertz when we increase by one PSI. And in conclusion, we determined that the mechanical driver with the swept sign signal was the most reliable for taking data, even though it is uh, uh, or unpreferred uh, when taking data for resonant frequencies. Uh, we also determined that suspending the head on strings was the most reliable in response measurements rather than clamping it on the table or resting on the table. We also concluded that driver contact location affects amplitude and resonant peaks, and that even just slight, slight changes could impact the Hertz or impact the frequency significantly. And we also are still addressing the problem with large damping as uh, animal mono provides challenge to, or challenges in obtaining these re uh, reliable frequency responses. And it could be relatively difficult when looking at small intracranial pressure changes. And in the future, we hope that we will be able to get more consistent and reliable frequency plots. And then in the future, hopefully be able to change the pressure inside of the skull and use a possible swept sign signal to look at uh, possible frequency shifts. And thank you. Are there any questions? Yes.
Uh, well, relatively, the sheep head itself has a very small area. If I can go back to that. We were trying to focus most of our time in this area because it is the closest to the actual uh, brain inside of the sheep skull, which we realized a sheep skull later on might not be the best of uh, animals because it has such a small area that we we're trying to analyze. And we wanted something that would mimic uh, the crane or like a human skull as best as possible. Uh, in the short answer, we would have to reverse engineer basically what we're doing here. Um, that would take a lot more research and a lot more time to understand. Uh, I think ideally we would first want to focus on a cadaver that we could control to test and see if we actually can see these changes in frequency. Thank you. Oh should be but um this will be the first trial run of that let me make sure that we see her on the zoom okay there she is jess can you hear us okay i can hear you great can you hear me yeah could people hear jess let's do one more Jess, say test for us testing testing one two three everyone hear her all right all right we're in business all wonderful right. what's that okay Thanks. I think we might have you up here. Do you see it in here? No. Nope. Okay. So which folder did you say? Late. Goodness. Um, hang on. Okay. Okay, we're we going under physics. We don't see it here. She said it was in a folder called late. Ooh, we do not have that on here. Goodness, do you, any of you happen to have it on a thumb drive? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> I have it on my laptop if you'd like me to screen share. We got it, Jess. Okay, perfect. That could be another option as well. Okay, I think we have to take this out. This Okay. And it's just called Sips. Okay. There at the top. All right, perfect. We'll move that off. Open, make sure it's all somehow we want it. Okay. Make sure we're still everything showing up on Zoom. So we'll start the video. Let's do one more sound check, Jess. Okay. Testing, testing. All right, she's still with us. 
And so. Grab these and get out of your way. Oh, you want to work there? Sure. Yeah. Otherwise, you guys will just. We just keep going. Yeah. We have to introduce the Wildcat Rocket Do you care if I take this off? The sand? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Hello, I'm Henry. I'm Dominic. I'm Michaela. And I'm Al. And I'm Jessica. Take us away, Jess. All righty. Welcome. So we wanted to talk to you about our research in competing in this NASA 2022 student launch. So we are a group. We are part of Wildcat Rocketry. There are nine of us total, but only of these few of us here who did this for our research. For a little bit of information about what the NASA Student Launch is, this is a yearly competition based around rockets with a changing criteria every year. So this year, the three sort of cornerstones of the competition were the scientific payload contest, the altitude, and then the STEM engagement. For the scientific payload, this was sort of the spirit of the mission this year, and it was to simulate an interplanetary mission. And the goal of that was to have our rocket have a payload that can autonomously detect where it landed and report back to us without the use of human interference, without the use of GPS or anything like that. So we had to get creative in coming up with how our rocket was gonna know where it landed. This is sort of like if we had a Mars mission and a rover landed on Mars, it would have to report back where it landed because we obviously aren't there to tell us where it landed. There's also the altitude portion where in one of our earliest documents, the preliminary design review, we had to declare an altitude between the ranges of 4,000 to 6,000 feet and then, you know, design, construct our rocket. And once we get to the final launch, we are aiming for that goal altitude. The further you are off from that altitude, the more points you lose. And if you are below 4,000 or above 6,000, that warrants disqualification. Another important part of this aspect of this competition, really the whole point of the competition is to engage the community and inspire students to think critically and step outside of their comfort zone, work on something challenging. So we had a wonderful section of STEM engagement that we did with this competition where we got to go out into the community and engage them in STEM activities and education. So obviously this presentation is gonna be a lot about rockets. So we're gonna run over just some of the basic components of a rocket so that we're all in the loop together. Dominic will be pointing out these aspects as I go through them. So we have the airframe, that is the body of the rocket. That is sort of the bare bones, outside structure, what you see. The motor is the portion of the rocket that ignites it and provides the thrust. This is what is going to lift it into the air, and that is located inside the motor tube. Fins, we have four fins. These provide stability for the flight, same way fins provide stability for a shark. And our fins are sort of this trapezoidal shape you see here. And then two really important vocab I wanna go over are drogue parachute and main parachute. The drogue parachute is the smaller parachute that comes out right after our rocket reaches apogee, that's its maximum altitude. That slows it down, but doesn't slow it down too much so it can make it down in a reasonable amount of time. And then right before the rocket is gonna hit the ground, our main parachute, a much larger parachute comes out and really softens the landing to give us that nice gentle crash into the earth. All right. So all right, so then the airframe of our rocket consists of three components. We have a five foot lower body section, which goes from this tape line all the way down to the base. A 25 inch upper body section, which goes from here up to this tape line. And then a 20 inch nose cone, which goes from here to the top, which consists of two individual parts, an 18 inch fiberglass section, and then a two inch clear plastic dome at the top. And then like Jess was saying, we have our drogue chute, which is 36 inches in diameter, which is that small one right there and our main chute, which is 72 inches in diameter. And those go on opposite sides of a 12 inch coupler, which is currently resting right in the middle of the lower and upper body sections. And so within our rocket, we have two different subsystems, our recovery subsystem, which is actually located inside the coupler and our payload system, which is located within the nose cone of our rocket. The recovery system has our drogue chute, which deploys one second after it reaches apogee or its highest altitude, and the main parachute, which deploys at 550 feet above ground level. Yes. 
So as Dominic said, um, that is controlled by these um, what are they called? Altus Metrum Easy Mini Altimeters, which are set to trip the drug parachute to eject at one second after apogee, which is basically a fancy way of saying at the highest point of flight. Um, and then the second charge is set to eject the main parachute at 550 feet above the ground. This is a redundant system, so we have backups in case those do not work. The stats for when those are deployed are set right there. Next, we actually have the meat and potatoes of the scientific payload. We have a Pixie 2 cam set up at the front, which looks out to that clear dome at the uh, tip of the rocket. It is trained to look at these two colors. Um, we want to use the most obnoxious colors we could find to have a powerful gradient um, to make sure that we have as best a chance to view it as possible. Those are oriented in a specific way so that when the camera sees it, it has a static way to view so it knows which way is up, which way is down. So as the nose cone actually rotates, we have a static viewpoint um, to gauge actual distance from. So as we look down, we set a scaling factor of one foot per pixel at 550 feet. Um, as the rocket descends and that changes, these calculations are run through the Arduino, um, communicated back to us at the computer via an XB radio. So as Jess said, we, a big part of our competition was STEM engagement and actually like teaching uh, groups. We interacted with five unique groups and we did seven unique activities. So two of those groups we did two activities with. We were required to reach 250 people and we reached a total of 376. Um, as you can see here in the bottom left, we are building rockets and teaching rocket parts to the local Cub Scouts. And then in the top right, we were actually teaching them how to pack parachutes and launching with them that day. So they're one of the groups that we did two separate events with. Um, so for a summary of our project, we've had to submit six different reports to NASA, and um, we've had to do presentations on three of them also to the NASA board. And all of this culminated in uh, all of this culminated in our final launch in Huntsville, Alabama. And so as Michaela said, everything we did uh, was building up to sort of this big event down in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, this is where the NASA Student, uh, student Launch Board uh, lives and works. And uh, we went, got to go down at the end of April and launch our rocket. We named her Newbie. Uh, and we got to go launch that rocket with the other teams down there. Um, so to walk you through some of these pictures here, on that far left, we have Newbie on the launch pad being set up by official National, National Association of Rocketeer members. Uh, they're in the white shirts with Tammy. She's the one seen there on the far left. She was our mentor. She's a Blue Origin engineer, and she reached out to us and got us connected. In the middle there, you see our team uh, just in front of the NASA meatball, uh, just having a good old time. Bottom right, this is the poster that the NASA student leader, or stu NASA student launch board made for us. It says Central Washington University on it. It says NASA. It says student launch. We think it's super cool. We got to take it home and we have it back in the rocket room. And then finally in the top right, that's myself and Jess working on setting up our recovery payload. Um, we were there with, I want to say 27 other teams from across the country. Uh, other teams launched from home, but we got to go there and have a grand old time. From that, though, this launch was the official graded launch. As Jess talked about earlier, we are graded on our apogee from our target apogee. In Huntsville, we reached a total apogee of 4,087 feet. Uh, using software called Open Rocket, it's this free software that you can use to simulate and design rockets, uh, we were simulating an apogee of 4,137 feet. Uh, we were well below our target apogee, 330 feet below our target apogee, but we still were within competition requirements, so we feel really good about that. Uh, we're a first-year team, so that was a huge accomplishment for us. Uh, unfortunately for us, our scientific payload battery died on the launch pad. So even though it's the super snazzy system that can recognize color and give us distance, uh, we were unable to get any data from it. And finally, one other little quirk that happened was our shock cord got tangled with the shroud line of our main parachute. Uh, you can go watch this happen on the NASA stream. Uh, they still have it on the NASA Marshall Space Center YouTube channel. Uh, the descent uh, wasn't as clean as we liked, but we still landed safely. And obviously, she came home in the appropriate number of pieces. Um, on the right here, this is the data recorded by the Altus Metrum Easy Mini Altimeters. This is where we get fun stuff like what our Apogee was, 
how many Gs we went through, what mock we hit. Um, so that's where that data comes from. And finally, just a fun little thing. Uh, this is from the NASA Twitter. Uh, this reports uh, the preliminary altitude results uh, from the competition. Because this launch is graded based on altitude, uh, we get to see sort of an idea of where we stand. Um, we were in the first volley. There were three total volleys. Um, but you can see there are some really, uh, really good competition going on there. Uh, we were there with the U.S. Naval Academy, Vanderbilt, Virginia Polytech. And I'm very pleased with how we did. Uh, it's been a fantastic project. And I think we've all learned a lot and done a lot. That is everything we have. Thank you for your time. And we are open for questions. Yeah, for sure. So we were able to test this in scale in Discovery, and we also did a launch over at White Swan, uh, where we did test it. Um, the code was a little buggy at that point. Um, so we unfortunately had the X position printed as the X and Y position, um, but it was accurate to about 100 feet, um, where our grids were each 250 feet by 250 feet. So we did get the X grid location correct. The Y grid location was incorrect because we were printing the X location as the Y location. Um, so it does work. We have tested it in scale after that launch, and we are able to get pretty accurate data from it. But unfortunately, it died on the pad there. So during our tests, we are getting good stuff. During the official event, not so much. How are we deploying the parachutes? So what we have are these parachute bags. And what these are protecting the parachute from is black powder. Uh, we have the uh, electronics there that will ignite a piece of black powder or a little vial of black powder that will then pressurize the chamber. That chamber will then blow apart, breaking through shear pins, which are these little nylon screws uh, that stick in some of the holes. Um, those will blow apart uh, and our parachute will get yanked out of this parachute bag and just open because of the wind, essentially. Preparing for the final launch, I would have loved to have more people uh, on this team, more people from other departments, more people in general. Uh, we are a first year team. Uh, we have never competed in the NASA student launch before. We went in blind. Uh, we went in with three people actually at the very start of the project. Luckily we grew to nine, um, but I would love to get more people in on this. Uh, we did really good for what we had. So I can only imagine what a bigger and stronger team could do. Yeah. I'll keep talking. Um, uh, Tammy King, uh, she reached out to us, actually. She saw us on the NASA media release, I believe. And she reached out to, I want to say Dr. Palmquist, who got connected with Dr. Snowden and through the grapevine got connected with us. Um, she's been fantastic, absolutely instrumental. Uh, she knows uh, a crazy amount about uh, these model rockets. Um, she'll send us pictures sometimes of her day at Blue Origin working on these huge B4 engines. And be like, ah, yeah, this is what I worked on today. Um, so she's had amazing knowledge. This drogue bag was actually made by Trish, her partner. Um, so they've been an absolutely instrumental part of this project. Uh, Tammy has been fantastic for us. Yeah. Thank you. Next talk here. Our next speaker is Ben Hansen from the White Lab.
Hello, hello. Aha, uh-huh. okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Ben Hansen, and uh, this is Accessible Band Structure Computation. So we'll start off with what even is a band structure? And th- there's an example there on the right. Uh, it's a bit complicated. Don't understand what all is going on there. It's okay, we'll, we'll get into that. But essentially what it is, is it's all about energy. So what energies electrons can take within a material? And this can be used to understand various electronic properties of material or even predict new materials with properties if we can manufacture them, such as metallic hydrogen. Uh, And so this is very useful to material scientists and solid state physicists to theoretically predict their work. So a simple example of a band structure looks like this. Uh, This is of, you have an electron that's constrained to move in one dimension on a line with no forces or anything on it. Its energy band structure will look like this parabola here. We have K and energy, and energy is about proportional to, was proportional exactly to K squared. The specific formula is H bar squared K squared over 2M. And K is related to the momentum. It's sort of a spatial frequency. So if we take this simple example and let's say we mess with it a little bit, add a periodic potential that looks like a cosine with the cosine, the, the periodicity of a lattice. It'll look like this. And uh, it's a little bit different. Got some big breaks in the allowed energies there. And this, and they happen around that 0.5 and 1 and negative 0.5, negative 1 marks, because that's, that's roughly where, those are so-called Brion zone boundaries, which is where the potential is sort of, has the strongest effect, because in the middle of things, it, uh, it doesn't really affect things much. That's where electrons aren't moving, they aren't interacting with the potential all that much. But when you start getting towards those boundaries, it has a lot more effect, which is why you get this big splitting. And I've put some suggestive vertical lines in there because if you stop and take a look at this and think for a while, you might think, ah, what if we take that bit on the right, move it over to between those two lines, and take that bit on the left and move that over between the lines? What would that look like? It would look something like this. You can see these weird broken pieces joined together into distinct bands. And so this is where the band structure, the name comes from. So you get these distinct bands of energies that are allowed. So now we've gone over that. How do we actually calculate one of these things? What sort of options are there? The methods out there that exist are, you can go the old fashioned by hand way. It's pen and paper, you set up a big old matrix and find its eigenvalues, those are your energies. You have to do that for each band that you want. Takes a while, easy to make mistakes, very boring. Or if you'd like a computer to do it, you can use some uh, very powerful software packages such as Quantum Espresso or Bean 2 k which are incredibly powerful. That band structure earlier was computed with something like that. However, these are more designed to run on say supercomputer clusters that your typical undergraduate probably doesn't have access to. So if you are the typical undergraduate wanting to dig into band structures, learn more about them, how to compute them, and what kinds of uh, things you could do with that, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's not a good option for you. So we decided to fill in the gap with a program that would be easy to use and interpret uh, and useful in the classroom, such as in Physics 441, which is offered here, and also be able to run on the computer that you would have access to in the classroom. And so it was written in Python because it has very good numerical, uh, scientific, and visualization libraries, such as NumPy and Matplotlib. And it is very simple to set up and run, especially because uh, in physics programs, Python is often already used, so the whole the whole prerequisites will likely be installed on the computer already. Is just plug and play essentially. 
the features features of the program are program uh, you can you give it you set up the parameters of the potential in the lattice so uh so like lattice shape the type of potential that you put into it and then uh, parameters for plotting it such as colors and all that fun stuff and then it will run through calculate the band structure for those parameters and display it to you with the the visualization settings you put in and you can additionally produce a density of state plot shown alongside the band plot which sort of condenses some of the information that a band plot can give you the interface it looks like this it's not the prettiest to look at, but it is functional uh, before anything. So you can, over on the left, towards the top is where you can input, or just the left side in general is where you input all the parameters for the potential, the lattice, and the graphing, and all of that. And then on the right is where your band plot and density of states plot will show up once you decide to calculate them. So what kinds of things can you do with this? Well, for example, let's, uh, let's take a look at how a simple periodic potential will affect the band structure of a square, two-dimensional square lattice. So something that looks like that up above, just a square grid of whatever atom you may feel inclined. So if you run through with the empty lattice approximation, which is where you assume that the electrons are in a lattice, but you assume that the lattice doesn't affect them at all, S similar to the, the parabola we saw before. You'll get a band structure that looks something like this. It's a lot more complicated looking because there's, maybe kind of hard to see, but there's little Greek letters there and there at the bottom along the high symmetry points axis. That's, those represent different K values like before, but because it's two dimensional, you have to follow a, I couldn't find a good picture of this, unfortunately, but within you could each little square. It, 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 <clears throat> sorry, uh, there's high symmetry points, which are significant points that tell you a lot about how the lattice behaves. And you draw a path through those, and those are your different Ks, and those are, that's what's plotted, plotted there. So we have this empty lattice approximation. Uh, band structure. Now, we want to see how that changes if we apply a simple cosine potential to the uh, to this lattice. And that can get you something that looks like this. Uh, so there's a little bit of spaghetti going on here. But the the band structure that we saw before is in now it is now in blue and in black is a new band structure for the cosine potential. And what you can see is that a lot of cases where we'd have two bands lying on top of each other or two bands meeting together and then splitting back apart, a lot of those are completely uh, removed from, like, completely split apart the whole time. So, like, at the top there on the, so that'll, that'll be on the left, the very top band in black, if you look in the blue, it might be kind of hard to see, but there are two bands in the blue that sit on top of each other, but one of them only moved up a little bit, and then one of them moved up a whole lot. So this so-called degeneracy was lifted by applying this periodic potential. And this is a very general phenomenon that gets more pronounced as you have more complicated potentials, but still does show up even at the most simple case you could think of. So, <laughs> Yes, uh, in summary, there is, there's a lack of easy to use and accessible band structure computation software and methods for undergraduates. So we filled in the gap with some software that can, uh, that can do that, that is interactive and uh, works just on, a, on this computer here even. So uh, that is all today, any questions? There in the back.
Uh, sorry, what was that? Ah, very good question. Well, so calculating band structures is a thing that's been done before. So essentially, we would uh, calculate, like, find something that someone uh, find a band structure that has been calculated, and then calculate that with the same parameters and compare the results. And they've all looked the same so far. So. <clears throat> Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, we'll see. Dr. Brunson here in the front. It probably, I, I think it could. Uh, it would need a bit more setup of right, saying, being able to tell it what the Fermi level is. And uh, it currently doesn't have a, all of the different lattice types you could want to compute a little, uh, put into it, but that is uh, on the docket working towards it. <clears throat> there in the back. Oh, uh, yes, in fact, that, that is a capability of the, the program. Didn't show it off here, but there are um, a couple other options uh, already built in. And in fact, they are inputted as the as Fourier series, essentially. So they already are linear combinations of, uh, of those cosines. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, that will depend on the parameters. Uh, it, if you try to calculate a whole lot of bands with it, it will take a while. And there's also a resolution parameter in there that, that uh, it's kind of how many points in between each high symmetry point it will calculate. And so if it's taking a while, you can move that down to bring computation times down a little bit. But for, uh, it's for smaller band structures with on the order of like nine or 10 bands, uh, I like the ones that I sh showed earlier. That will that took uh, very little time on my computer, and shouldn't take more than a second or two, even on fairly slow computers. <laughs> oh, uh, <clears throat> there is most of the work was done on two-dimensional lattices, just because they're easier to implement, easier to work with. So there is a two-dimensional square lattice and a two-dimensional hexagonal lattice, as well as a three-dimensional simple cubic lattice. And th the next one in progress is a three-dimensional face-centered cubic lattice, although that one's not quite uh, finished uh, because inputting the different paths to move along is, has been challenging. Hello, I'm Nicholas Klein, um, and I'm presenting about the consequences of reducing symmetry in quantum systems. So symmetry is something that's everywhere. Uh, we, we see it in animals, in plants, in humans, and in atoms, and it can be very useful. We can use it to fill in missing information because we expect the symmetry to be there. And some common examples that we'll see of symmetry are rotational. So here at the square, we say that you can rotate it 90 degrees, and it will look exactly the same. And you can do that four times. And so it has fourfold rotational symmetry. Uh, another common example is reflectional symmetry. So here on this triangle, you can go through the different axes of it, and you can put a mirror there and reflect that triangle, and it looks exactly the same. So we say that this triangle has threefold reflectional symmetry. But in quantum mechanics, often symmetry is more abstract and mathematical. We could be talking about this type of symmetry, but typically we'll be talking about some, something like the symmetry of a Hamiltonian, which is related to the total energy of a system. Or here on the left, we have uh, symmetries of a function, a wave function trapped in a potential, or maybe the symmetries of 
the electron orbitals in atoms. So the goal of this research project is to look at the consequences of reducing symmetries in the system and see what that does uh, to different energy levels and how it affects the degeneracy. So how many states have the same energy? So in this picture here, you can see that starting off, these, these three states have the same energy, but doing some sort of perturbation or change, that system will lift the degeneracy so that all three of those have distinct energies. And to do this, um, two test systems were used, uh, which are both triangular anti-ferromagnetic systems. And so what that means is that we have three spin one-half particles, each experiencing some magnetic exchange interaction between them. And uh, what that is, is it's related to the uh, interaction of two spin one-half particles and how close they are in an atom. And uh, here, that shows up in the Hamiltonian as a dot product of the two spins. And so this is saying that if those spins are in the same direction, we'll get a positive value or a higher energy. And if they're in the opposite direction, we'll get a negative energy. And so it's more energy favorable for the system to be anti-aligned, and that makes them anti-ferromagnetic. And, um, to re and this system has threefold rotational symmetry um, because you can rotate it 120 degrees and you can do that three times and it looks exactly the same, as well as threefold reflectional symmetry. And so the next system is to reduce that. And this is done by moving particle two and three closer together so that that exchange interaction that they undergo is stronger. And what this does is it removes the threefold rotational symmetry that was present before. And now we only have one uh, reflectional symmetry right down the middle there. And what this does to the Hamiltonian is now the three dot products that were present before are still there, but they're split between two different exchange interactions. And so these Hamiltonians are very inconvenient to work with. And so we want to rewrite them in terms of things that we can actually characterize better. Um, and this is more helpful as well as necessary to really analyze these systems. So first for the isotropic systems where they all have the same exchange interaction, uh, we characterize the total spin of the system by adding together the individual spins. And we can dot that into itself to get the total spin squared of the system, which is related to the magnitude of spin. And doing some clever algebra and manipulation, we can rewrite all of those dot products in terms of just the spin squared of the total as well as the individual spins. And this makes the Hamiltonian here at the bottom uh, much cleaner. Now for the anisotropic case where we move those two particles closer together, it's not quite as nice. And we have to use an identity for dot products to write it in terms of the Z component of the spin with the subscript Z, the raising operator with a subscript plus, and the lowering operator with a subscript minus. And this gives us a much less nice Hamiltonian, but it is actually better to work with. And this is because we can characterize all of these different operators. So here um, with this total spin squared SM, that just shows the, the total spin squared operator acting on a state of our system. And this state is essentially just the configuration of our spin one half particles and whether they're aligned or anti-aligned, which ones are spin up and which ones are spin down. And so with the total spin squared operator, we can get the same state back and times some constant, which is related to the magnitude of spin. And with the Z component of spin, it's a similar thing, but now it's related to M, which is the Z component of the spin. Now for the raising and lowering operators, these are similar, but instead of giving you the same state back, you actually go to the next state uh, in terms of M. So if it's a spin down, it'll turn into a spin up when you do the raising operator. If it's spin up, it'll turn into a spin down and you apply the lowering operator. So doing this, rewriting the Hamiltonians, we can use the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which in terms of operators, such as the Hamiltonian, is very nice. Here we just have this H times the state is equal to the energy of that state times the state again. And in doing this, we can get eight unique configurations or states for this system. So on the left-hand column, it's written in terms of the total spin and the M or, uh, and the Z component spin M. But on the right hand side, we have it in terms of the different configurations of the spins, whether they're up or down, represented by arrows. 
And so we first, for the top two states, those are just all three of them up or all three of them down. But for the others, we have some combination of different configurations of those spins. And the number out in front is related to the probability of being in any of those states. And you'll notice here that there are four states with a total spin equal to three halves and four states equal to total spin is equal to one half. And the interesting thing about the total spin is equal to one half is that there are two states that have the same S and M or two sets of states that have the same S and M. And this is because these states are orthogonal to each other. And when we look at these states and act with the Hamiltonian and find the energies, we can come up with a diagram here where the vertical axis is showing you the energy of the states. And here we have the four spin is equal to three half states all having the same energy. And we have the spin equals one half states all having the same energy. When we just look at that isotropic system where they all have the same exchange interaction. But when we bring those two particle two and three closer together and increase that exchange interaction, we see changes in those energy levels. So going to the right side, uh, we see that the spin equals three halves, they're still all the same energy, but they're at an increased energy. And for the spin equals one half states, the doublet there, they split their degeneracy and we have two sets of energies with twofold degeneracy, one higher than it previously was and one lower than it previously was. But this isn't the only type of symmetry that needs to be looked at. We can also talk about time invariant symmetry. And uh, in this case, we're seeing if Newton's second law is the same with time going forwards as it is going backwards. So a time invariant case would be just some particle moving with no forces acting on it. If, it, if, we, if time moves forward, the particle moves to the right. But if we rewind the tape and time moves backwards, we see that it goes along the path we would expect given that there's no forces acting on this particle. But this can be broken by applying a magnetic field to the system. So here we have a not time invariant system where a charged particle is moving in some magnetic field. So on the left here, uh, it's the particle is moving to the right. And so it'll feel a force downwards, which makes its trajectory go downwards. But if we take that and rewind the video, if we just take a video of it, then we see that moving in the other direction causes the force to point um, toward up and to the right. And so its path should go uh, up and should curve upwards. But rewinding the video, we see that it doesn't follow that path. And so this force is inconsistent with time invariance. And so that symmetry is broken. So applying this to our test system with the isotropic system and making a magnetic field that's pointing in the Z direction, uh, we get a similar Hamiltonian where it just has the interactions between the spins. But we also have this, these additional three terms that are related to the Z components of those spins uh, interacting with the magnetic field applied. And when we do this, when we look at the states and look at the energies of those states, we see that the four three equals, spin equals three have states all uh, end up having different energies. So all the degeneracy is lifted of that quartet and those are split up by the different values of the Z component of the spin. But when we look at the uh, spin equals one half states, those still split up into two different sets with the same energy. And what we can conclude from this is that reducing symmetry in general will lift degeneracy, but not all of it uh, oftentimes. And in the future, um, some research could look, uh, some future research I could do will be looking into different types of symmetry breaking or different sort of interactions, um, such as fine structure or spin orbit coupling, uh, relativistic effects, just to see how those would lift the degeneracy or how it would affect the system. And so I want to give some acknowledgments to Dr. White for advising this research, allowing this to happen, uh, as well as Nicholas Puentes for helping with the first part of this research in looking at the states. And that's everything. Uh, yeah, Dr. Kwa. Uh, 
Uh, well, in the system, uh, we have the mag these magnetic dipoles, and uh, in a magnetic field, a dipole will experience um, a, a torque in a magnetic field. And so that's where we get this sort of uh, time invariance being broken in that system. Uh, I haven't thought uh, too much about doing experimental work that I think that would be interesting to look into. We need to do some planning on that, but it would be interesting to sort of see how, see how these results play out with uh, an experiment. All right, good. Okay, so my name is Zachary Goh. Uh, this is determining versatile wave functions, sorry, determining versatile wave functions to use in variational principle calculations. Uh, and my mentor is Dr. Benjamin White. So just a little brief introduction before we hop straight into things on energy, because uh, it's very uh, important and central in physics in both classically and quantum mechanically. Uh, it allows us to extract um, various, you know, bits of information about perhaps a system or an object that, uh, that we are interested in. For example, uh, classically, um, if we perhaps wanted to model the kinetic energy of this uh, bullet traveling through the translational kinetic energy of this bullet traveling through the air, it can be modeled by this relatively simple formula, which depends on its mass and the square of its velocity. Uh, likewise, we could model the potential energy perhaps of the soccer ball um, sitting some distance y above the ground. Um, which is uh, a function of its mass. It's, you know, like I said, it's height above the ground and it's uh, in the gravitational acceleration constant near Earth. Um, quantum mechanically, though, things get a little bit more interesting uh, just due to, well, first, you know, you see this graphic on the right here. Um, so a, part, a quantum mechanical, you know, particle can exist in its ground state energy, which is its lowest energy. Um, and then it can be excited up to uh, different energy states, um, but it does so, you notice, in a discrete fashion, which is vastly different from what we had before. Um, these parameters back here are continuous parameters, so we can take on any energy value we want. Here, that's not the case. Um, the ground state energy here is going to be is, is of central importance in this uh, in this uh, presentation. Um, essentially, what we are going to do is we're going to take a set of wave functions, which represent particles, um, apply the variational principle to them, which is um, a technique, one of many techniques that we can use to approximate uh, upper bounds of, um, of our test wave functions. And what we are going to do is with our set of wave functions, we're going to apply the variational principle to each of them and then see which... Uh, of those wave functions offers us the most versatile results. By versatile results, um, what I mean is, let's say we have uh, two wave functions, we perform the variational principle on both of them, and we get two different answers, one of higher magnitude, one of lower magnitude. The uh, result um, of lower magnitude that we obtain is going to be said to be the most versatile. The reason being is because, like I said, we're um, we're setting an upper bound on our uh, expectation value for our energy. So if we have a lower value for our expectation value, that means that we're constraining a little bit our um, the the energy values that that uh, actual wave function can take on, which means that it's going to be more accurate. Okay. So moving forward uh, with our just general research question, which of our three test wave functions offers the most versatile results for our ground state energies across four potentials that we have chosen? So uh, these are the mathematical definitions of our wave functions, and I've named, or well, they are named, the Gaussian, uh, the Lorentzian, and the hyperbolic secant. Um, this right here doesn't really tell us a whole lot except for just symbols and numbers. So this is what they actually look like. Um, uh, and it looks like the B value, this, this T looking thing here, I don't, I'm not sure if that's showing up on your screen, but that's supposed to be a pi. I'm not really sure what's going on, but um, uh, you, so, this is what they look like. Um, the B values that you see up on the top left here are intentionally chosen such that the initial values x equals zero, psi equals one, 
um, are met so that we can get a clear overlay right here at psi equals one so that we can uh, very uh, easily compare how these things look and how they're gonna behave. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that the, uh, although the trends for the wave functions are very similar, uh, they are different, obviously. The Gaussian, for an example, the purple curve converges to zero a lot quicker uh, than the hyperbolic secant and the Lorentzian wave function. Uh, another noteworthy thing about these wave functions is that uh, there's no mistake behind um, you know, their presentation. They're, they're intentionally chosen uh, by the fact that they need to meet criteria for real wave functions, which are they have no nodes. Uh, they are even functions about the center of the well and that the uh, wave functions converge to zero as X goes to positive infinity and negative infinity. Um, these are the four potential wells that we are working with. Um, they're pretty simply mathematically defined here. Um, you can see that we have very aggressive curves such as the uh, V equals A times X to the fourth curve. Um, and then they kind of, you know, just decrease their, you know, quote unquote aggressiveness, their, their steepness as we, uh, you know, work our way down here. Um, and the steepness of these curves is also going to be very important um, with and explaining why we get certain results. Um, so speaking of results, uh, so you go through, you do the variational principal calculations, and I've created this table here. You'll notice that for the hyperbolic secant wave function for the uh, fourth potential, A times the square root of absolute value of X, um, Mathematica was the uh, program that was used to calculate uh, these values. And uh, Dr. White's computer ran this calculation for over an hour, I think he said, and we still cannot come up with a result for it. So for our uh, purposes, we're just going to uh, disqualify that, um, that section from our um investigation here but uh other than that you can you can see just looking uh closely if you um the gaussian wins three of the four of our uh in three of the four of the potentials that we have chosen um the uh lorentzian uh however also loses uh every single time even uh in the second uh, potential we have here the interval, the integral doesn't even converge. It just diverges, goes to infinity. So we can't even make any meaning of it. Um, so yeah, why is this happening? What's going on here? Why is the Gaussian performing so well? Why is the Lorentzian performing so poorly? Another, you know, interesting thing is, is we uh, decrease the quote unquote aggressiveness of our potential curves. The, the Lorentzian never wins, but it gets better and better. So you might notice for the second curve, I said it diverges. For the least aggressive curve, which is the last one here, they're almost, I, it's almost the same as the Gaussian. So that's something that is, to me, noteworthy um, and was worth investigation. So um, I'll draw your attention back to the potentials that I uh, just had up there. You'll notice that um, if, if you just think about it, um, if we have a really steep potential as we have this blue curve right here, it only makes sense that if we have a potential like this, that our wave function is gonna be very narrow because what we are saying is that it requires a lot of energy for us to be, you know, way up in this area, you know, V equals, you know, on here it's six, eight, whatever. Um, so we're just gonna have naturally narrower uh, wave functions um, to work with. Uh, on the contrary of that, if you take a, a less aggressive curve such as the green curve, the V equals A times the absolute value of X, uh, you might expect a little bit broader of a wave function because the, the, due to the nature that the, the potential well is less aggressive, it's giving it a little bit more room to work with essentially. And you might end up, you know, so what that means is there's gonna be higher probabilities of finding uh, the particle, uh, the way, yeah, the particle represented by that wave function out here on these ends as you would uh, compared to this more aggressive A times X to the fourth curve. Um, another thing that I want to point out is I'm just going to pull this back up and I've pulled the hyperbolic secant out of this graph just so we can compare the, um, narrowest and the broadest, uh, wave function, but, um, you, you'll notice obviously the Lorentzian is very broad. Um, and so that helps us explain a little bit why under the very steep, uh, V equals a times X to the fourth curve that the integral diverges, because essentially what's happening is 
uh, the potential well is not giving the wave function enough time, sorry, enough time to, um, to converge on itself, if you will. Um, it's, you know, because you're integrating all these things together. If you have an X to the fourth term and then an X to the negative two term, um, you know, it's, it's just gonna blow up. So that, that uh, is very self-explanatory in that respect. Um, and so, yeah, so conclusions and potential future developments. So we started with a classical view of energy and expanded that idea a little bit to uh, um, energy and quantum mechanics to describe quantum phenomena investigated in this project. We use the variational principle on three test wave functions and four potential wells to find the most versatile performer amongst the test wave functions. Uh, we saw that in three out of four cases, the Gaussian was the superior choice for our test wave function, offering the lowest ground state energy. Um, and we also noticed that uh, we, we noticed patterns as to why uh, the Gaussian performed so well uh, compared to the other ones and also um, why the Lorentzian uh, wallet lost uh, in, in every competition. Uh, it's the, the accuracy of its results increased as we uh, broadened our potential well out a little bit. So, and that's all, I think. Yep, so any questions? Yeah, Dr. Bronstein? Are you asking me if I have the calculations in which, like basically running through the calculations and how I arrived at my results? Or I have. Okay. So how do I know that uh, the lower values for the Gaussian energy are said to be more accurate results? Uh, the reason is because when we apply the variational principle to these wave functions to determine the ground state energy, uh, we're, we are, uh, what we are doing is obtaining an upper bound limit for what, um, what uh, th those energies can be. So, you know, for an example, the Lorentz in here diverges, that's saying that the limit is infinity, so it can take on any value it's pretty meaningless at that point to, um, you know, discuss, you know, uh, how, you know, good of a wave function this is. It clearly isn't. So the lower uh, values for energy that we have, um, the, the tighter the constriction that we have on our results. And so that produces uh, greater accuracy. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. And so we are we at the beginning for you? Okay, perfect. All right, let's go ahead and welcome Jeff Lowry from the Future Lab. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Is that good? A little soft. Okay, I'll I'll lean in a little bit. Okay, is that better? All right, sounds good. So my name is Seth Lowry, and my presentation is on a quantitative assessment of uncertainty in the measurement of violent impact response. And I've been working in Andrew Piacek's lab. So the claim I'm investigating in my research is that it is a well-known and respected fact that violins have to be broken in with play. That's what was said by Rhiannon Knockbauer from Fiddlehead's Violin Studio. And I included a couple other testimonials from people online who quote that the first two weeks, uh, quite dramatic changes do happen when you're breaking in a violin and that the violin definitely improves over time. So the research, the most prominent research that I've been able to find on this is a 1995 study by George Bissinger, where he measured a violin and the emittance response curves 
uh, and gave it to a professional violinist. And then after about a year or 250 hours of playing, he measured it again and found a 2% decrease in modal frequencies, increase in peak amplitudes and changes in the mode shapes. A article published in Nature in 1996 also found that the sustained vibration uh, reduces the damping coefficient in spruce. But then in the next edition of Nature, another article was published saying that smaller damping coefficient in a violin isn't desirable and you can't hear the difference anyway. And then in 2003, uh, a study published by Grogan, Bronstein, and Piacek said that there were no changes in three spruce rectangles uh, after they were uh, mechanically excited for over 1400 hours. So the research on this is very varied and I think is particularly because it's so difficult to establish an experimental basis of uncertainty. So that's what my research question is. It's can we create a reliable method of quantifying the uncertainty in impact response? So my experimental design goals and challenges were to minimize the causes in experimental uncertainty during the measurements of the transfer admittance of the violin body and to determine the expected amount of deviation due to uncontrollable factors. So I'm trying to find a repeatable and reliable way of measuring the violin and uh, calculate a value of uncertainty using that uh, procedure. So the outline of this project was to develop an algorithm for calculating the uncertainty in admittance measurements for specified frequency ranges and to take re repeated measurements of a test violin over several days uh, attempting to keep experimental conditions as consistent as possible and understanding that uh, the point of this is that I can't recreate the experimental conditions perfectly, so I'm expected to produce small variations in the emittance measurement. Uh, that's what the algorithm is uh, comparing. And then I'm going to be validating the repeatability and reliability of the measurements in the uncertainty uh, or finding the variability in the uncertainty measurements. So this is my testing setup. You can see the violin is sitting there. And uh, what I do before every uh, measurement is I tune the strings and mute them. You can see the, I don't know if I have a laser pointer, but you can see the uh, there's a little cloth ribbon and the strings. That's to detach the measurement from the strings so that the violin doesn't vibrate because the strings are vibrating. I want to only control it with this little force hammer here uh, that I pull back and tap the bridge and that's what's creating the response in the violin body. And so the vi violin is also vi vibrationally isolated with rubber bands. You can see at the top here, the, the rubber bands are the only thing touching the neck of the violin and at the base of the violin, uh, it's resting on some more rubber bands. There are six points of this violin. You can see two at the top, two in the middle, and two at the bottom, where the Polytech laser scanning Doppler vibrometer is used to measure the velocity. And just how that works, a simple rundown is it aims a laser at it. You can see the laser is pointing right here. And using uh, the Doppler effect, which is uh, used to calculate velocity, using the uh, reflection of that laser, it finds the very, very small uh, velocities and thus the amplitudes of how this is vibrating. And it's usually on the micron scale. So we need a laser, so it's very accurate. And this uh, rig design was inspired by Joseph Curtin's impulse measurement rig. He made a much nicer uh, and woodier version of it. We just kind of copied it. And this was built by the physics lab tech Peter Zensack. So thanks to him for that. And that is the full setup uh, with the laser scanning Doppler vibrometer pointed at the violin. So on the right, you can see this is what the vibrometer measurement uh, platform looks like. You can see the video of the violin is there and the point selection uh, is all there. And below it, you can see the admittance curve. So that's the velocity over force. Uh, the axes are the magnitude, so how much the violin is vibrating at a point, and the x-axis is the frequency, so at what uh, frequency the amplitude is at. So the force is measured by the PCB impulse force hammer by tapping the bridge, like I explained before. Uh, the velocity is measured at each point and is averaged over three taps. 
I'm taking data up to 10 kilohertz and all of the signal analysis is uh, performed by the Polytech software that comes with the uh, Doppler virometer. I created two programs using MATLAB. One was used to visually compare the measurements between days uh, just to get kind of a qualitative assessment of the difference between measurements. And another was to calculate the single value of uncertainty given a specific frequency range. And so the calculation program is kind of the answer to my research question that I mentioned earlier. And I'm gonna go into a bit more detail with that. So the basic functionality of the calculation program is to take the admittance data from the vibrometer and calculate a single normalized value of uncertainty. So that means the amplitude data has to be linearized because it's in units of decibels and that's a nonlinear uh, format and you can't perform linear operations on nonlinear data and that's what I need to do. Uh, so Within a, a specified frequency range, I calculate the standard deviation of the emittance values from multiple measurements. I'm gonna run through the math really quickly. Uh, so the amplitude data in the program that I made is contained within a single matrix with size number of measurements by the number of frequency bins. Uh, and then the sum of the square of differences between the mean and individual values is calculated and divided by the number of measurements. And so after that step, uh, the second step, you have a matrix of size one by the number of frequency bins because the days have been eliminated, it's now an average. And then the sum of these values is found in averaged and then the square root is taken, which produces a single value, which is then normalized by dividing by the maximum original value. So the uh, normalized values are then between zero and 1.0. So, this is just the code. Uh, you can see the sigma square value here. That was that would be step two that I just explained. And the sigma value is the final step. Uh, and then it is normalized by this maximum value that was found from the list of values. So this is a result graph. It's all of the data that I took uh, from October 15th to October 28th. Uh, it was in total 11 measurements of the violin body. And this is from zero to 10 kilohertz. And one thing uh, you can notice is that the difference between the measurements gets pretty drastic as you go past this 4,000 uh, hertz mark. And there's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of stuff going on there, but I'm not too particularly interested in those higher frequencies because they're not characteristic of the sound the violin makes. So, like I said, the comparison graph was created for 0.6, which is on the bottom right of the bridge of the violin, uh, but similar graphs can be made for any of the points measured. And the graph compares all the measurements to provide a qualitative assessment of the data. The axes can be manipulated to view specific frequency ranges in more detail, and the variance between measurements appears to be greater at higher frequencies, most likely due to the violin body not controlling the resonance uh, absolutely perfectly. And so this is a zoomed in version of the graph. Uh, this is mostly what I'm focused on, the range between zero and 1000 Hertz. I pointed out a few key areas, the A0 uh, mode, where a mode is just a range of frequencies that, is, that characterizes the sound of a violin. Uh, so that is the lowest mode. And this is the middle mode, the CBR range around the 400 Hertz mark. You can see these two distinct peaks. Uh, another peak here, and then this peak here is the B1 plus mode, which you can see in more detail here. So these are the results with the graph and superimposed on them are the sigma values calculated by my calculation program. And so these are the modal frequency ranges. Here's the A0 uh, stretched out. So this is only the frequencies of A0. And then the CBR mode, uh, this is only the frequencies of the CBR mode. So you can see those two distinct peaks are here. And then the B1 plus mode is also up there. You can't really see it because the talking is in the way. But uh, yeah, you can kind of qualitatively see that this is the lowest. Uh, and the, so, so the sigma value is the lowest. This is a little bit more, um, a little bit more different. The, the measurements are a little bit more different. And then this one really spreads out near the end. So it has the highest sigma value. So in conclusion, uh, I have found a method of quantifying the uncertainty in the measurements of violin impact response. 
and this will be used in future work to validate the possible changes in impact response uh, as we begin the violin shaking process that I'll explain in the next slide. And qualitative observation shows higher uncertainties at higher frequencies. So for the future work we're going to be doing on this is that uh, I'm going to be repeating these measurements and comparing uh, separate sets to like this set and others just to validate the dependability of this process of finding uncertainty. I'm also going to be taking measurements in the anechoic chamber because the data is basically the same. So the same calculation programs can be used for that. And I want to, we're going to be taking vibrational and acoustical data. So I, I want to make sure that this procedure works for both of them so I can uh, use both of them when the bulk of the experiment starts. And then we're going to start shaking the violins, uh, but first finding the uncertainty of the actual test violins. And that's a very important step because that is what is going to be compared to to uh, draw results from this experiment to see if the violins actually are changing over time. So this is the next step in the experiment. Uh, these are the three test violins. You see they have a lot more points on them. It's, it has 54 test points, uh, but I reduced it to six for the test violin because it's just uh, really tedious measuring three taps for 54 points on the violin. And so there's sibling violins, uh, which means they were made one after another. So you can see the uh, version numbers are down here. So they're sequential. So they're about as exact as we could get them. Uh, they were supplied by Hammond Ashley violins from Issaquah, Washington. And two of these violins will be mechanically excited for several months in an isolated box. So only that mechanical uh, excitation will be what is changing the violin or not changing the violin. That's what we're trying to find out. Uh, and then one of them will be controlled. Uh, so it's going to be kept in the same room under the same conditions, uh, but not excited. So it's, it's not exactly imperative to this since we are only comparing the violins to themselves, but we're also going to be comparing that control violin to itself just to make sure uh, that everything is, everything is good, that this is a solid experiment. And then emittance measurements will be made periodically uh, and analyzed for trending behavior. So every week or two, we will be taking the violins out of their boxes, making the measurements that uh, I made to find the uncertainties uh, with the laser scanning Doppler vibrometer and see if there's any trending behavior in the shifting of the amplitudes or frequencies. So I'd like to thank Peter Zensack for loaning me one of his violins to do this testing on, uh, because obviously I can't do it on the experimental violins, and also building that rig that you saw earlier. I'd like to thank Andrew Piacek for being my mentor on this project and providing a lot of assistance on writing the MATLAB code for this, because this was my first big uh, project in MATLAB. I'd also like to thank Hammond Ashley Violins for providing the three uh, main experiment violins and the CU Department of Physics for providing the excellent acoustics lab I've been working in. And I'll open for questions. Yes. Yeah, so so Courtney's measurement, we're it's almost completely different. So the the measurement sh rig she was using, she was hanging the violin upside down, which was fine, but she was also exciting the bridge with a uh, shaker, like you saw in uh, the skull resonance experiment, a, a mechanical shaker that was just kind of doing a uh, sign swept chirp on the bridge. So I think that. Uh, the, the deviation in the measurements might have been caused by that experimental setup. And so this is kind of the uh, second try, if you will, at uh, finding this uncertainty. And she was also investigating the modal shapes, uh, not so much finding a, a way to 
uh, calculate the uncertainty of measurements. Yes, Hansen. Yeah, so that's that's the whole thing. Uh, so in the uncertainty values, I'm not playing the violin. So this the violin I'm measuring right now hasn't been played. It hasn't been uh, quote unquote broken in. So I'm not seeing a trend in the measurements I'm making for the uncertainty. And that is what I'm going to be looking for moving forward with those three test violins. So if the if the behavior of those uncertainties is uh, trending upwards or if, how do I word this? So if the uncertainty values comparing batches of measurements after playing those test violins is greater uh, in a trending manner than the uncertainty values taken before they were uh, mechanically excited, that is primarily what we're looking for, if that answers your question. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, that's that's the big deal, right? <laughs> so uh, my opinion is I, I was a musician for 10 years before uh, coming to college and I stopped and I didn't play uh, wind. I did, well, wind. I didn't play violin, but I did play other instruments. And so this is a common thing among you know all instruments. And I personally never bought into it specifically because there is no distinguished research behind it. There's no like proof. Uh, but based on the research that I've read, uh, I personally think that it's not going to change as much as we think. And even if we do find that there is a, a difference or a trending behavior for the uh, vibrational uh, or the emittance response of the violin, that doesn't mean that we can perceive it. So that's a completely different experiment entirely. Uh, this is just focused on if, like, looking at the hard numbers, can we even establish a basis of the sound of a violin changing over time? But, yeah, like you said, a lot of people hypothesize that the wood changes. Uh, people have found that the, the structure of the wood breaks down as you play a violin because the vibration breaks the molecules. But also, even that is shaky because uh, the 2003 study that I cited vibrated the spruce panels, and spruce is one of the main woods used in violin and for 1,400 hours, which is a very long time, and didn't find any vibrationally, uh, the vibration response didn't change. So it's a hard question, yeah. Thank you.